Hi guys, hope you're keeping well. Uh, back with another video here, kind of like a bit of a mind expanding out of the box one. Uh, I was just thinking about um, ancient flying machines, the uh, Vimenu or Vimena, Vimena, I think it's how it's pronounced. Um, if they were real um, and they were capable of actual travel, let's say space travel, um, how did they differ to um, modern space travel now? And I would say like vastly, um, almost like complete opposite maybe of our understanding of how to achieve it now. And I think that's why we're limited. Um, and I think that's why we've only gone so far um, when it comes to space travel physically. Uh, this was inspired by... Um, Originally, um, Thomas's, Thomas Sheridan's um, video he did a couple of years ago about how he was talking about how the astronauts, um, you know, the American astronauts, when they uh, went to the moon and they came back, he said that they were um, not right. They, they basically had a big spiritual experience, a um, kind of... A, out of the box kind of um, transcendental kind of um, mind blowing reality bending kind of um, experience that shook them and uh, I don't think that they were prepared for it and I don't think that uh, they were guided properly you know I don't think anybody was prepared you know I don't think that anybody knew what to expect so so it's kind of not their fault. Um, but just uh, briefly looking at the Vimena, uh, these ancient flying machines that apparently existed, um, they're in um, Hindu myth. Um, one of them, uh, the Ramayana. Um, apologies if I pronounce it wrong because I'm really bad at pronunciations, as I keep saying. But um, yeah, briefly, I just made some notes. Uh, on the uh, Hindu uh, Ramayana myth in on Wikipedia, and the the Vimena is described as the sun um, going anywhere at will. Um, that chariot resembling a bright cloud in the sky, um, and it said, and the king Rama got into uh, the excellent chariot and. At his command, um, it rose up into the high atmosphere. I think it's called Vim Vimena or Vimenu. I can never get it right anyway. But um, so my feeling, like uh, I, I agree with uh, Max, um, is that um, these things were controlled by our consciousness and our mind. Um, it's it's very different compared to their understanding of space travel. Now I've made notes, and they're kind of like scattered in organized chaos on the floor so but um just looking at modern space travel um like now it's kind of it's more if you had like the ancient astronauts so we shall we say if that's what they did they would see that uh, i think uh hardware and our technology uh, is more developed the physical is more developed we have a lot more of that um, than they ever did for I, th I have a feeling because um, maybe back then it was like maybe like 25 percent hardware technology and 75 percent mental powers or maybe it was like five percent tech and or nine or one percent and the other 99 percent was all mental powers um and today it's almost like it's the other way around it's you know like 75 percent technology and you know like 25 percent mental preparation or if any mental preparation but i mean i mean um obviously like i think they got it part right when um these uh these american astronauts you know from my understanding they were ex-military um, so they, 
they were more prepared, obviously, than a normal civilian. Like um, I know Thomas Sheridan mentions this that you know it's not a guaranteed two-way trip, so they were prepared to die and face death. You know, I think they had their cyanide pills. This wouldn't freak them out compared to a civilian. You know, so that's important. I think that you had to have servicemen, military servicemen, go up there. Um, so that was good. And so in a way, they were prepared. They wouldn't freak out uh, if, if something went wrong. Um, but I just feel they were ill prepared um, in just the understanding, I think, of how uh, reality works. Um, just you could say like the uh, the zeitgeist of the time, you know, the current consciousness just just wasn't ready for space travel. And um, this is why I think Thomas Sheridan's onto something when they came back and they were probably told don't comment and don't speak out on what you saw and what you felt and everything because I I'm sure I'm you've probably seen them on YouTube I think it's uh they were saying that they saw UFOs they called them critters outside you know the, the windows and everything um so I'm absolutely like completely uh open-minded that there's probably like life forms out there that are um just not like our own, not carbon based and organic. So, and I know uh, Thomas Sheridan mentioned that that would throw a complete spanner in the works of evolution, you know, what we're taught in schools. So, um, so I think they were ill prepared and that wasn't their, their fault. But, um, and another thing is, um, you know, they say in certain points within the earth, the, um, the veil can thin between. Um, this reality and other realities like the spirit world basically and then you can have a bleed through um, this is probably dealing with like um, you know basically uh, energy vibration frequency and all of that well what about if you when you enter space there practically is no veil between you and what's out there like um, so there's no protection you know it's um the the um, vibrational frequencies all changed. I mean, maybe maybe the atmosphere actually plays a physical part in an actual force field, protecting you from these other realms and gravity and everything and you know momentum and all of that with the Earth spinning. But it's not there in space, so maybe anything goes. Maybe you know you really are in contact with the other side, and you're in contact with the good, the bad, the ugly. And um, and things can get really hairy if you're not prepared. So you know, I I was thinking that um, future um, astronauts and space travelers, well, why not have them um, practiced in magic and the occult? Um, you know, mainly for uh, like psychic protection and things like that, um, as well as um, how they could make the most of their journey and. Um, perform magic rituals up there that uh, you may never be able to achieve on earth uh, where the energy is right and everything but they'd have to be clued in they'd have to be um, magical practitioners and occultists not just um, somebody who's ex-military I'd say like a combination of the two would be good um, and you know they're really flexible in their thinking out of the box you know, to begin with, and, um, you know, f perhaps fully experienced in um, out-of-the-body phenomena and things like that, any hallucinogenics, you know, um, you know, they could have taken them, so that, you know, not much will shock them when it comes to high strangeness, right? So you're not just dealing in life-or-death physical emergency of the of the craft catching fire, you're, you're, you'll be dealing with what if you come into contact with, you know, um, non-incarnated spirits trying to communicate with you voices in your head psychic attacks you know for all you we know they kept their mouth shut because the moment they got out there it was voices in the head it was things trying to come into them they were seeing them out by the window by the you know shape-shifting it could have been um super high strangeness you know like you couldn't imagine so um that that's really interesting isn't it and um 
and I want to mention a uh, film uh, that really got me thinking about this. Let's get my notes here. Which was the film The Abyss. Um, it came out in the 1980s, about mid 80s. And if you haven't seen it, have a watch. Um, and uh, this really um, connects uh, with what I'm saying. They say that um, the deep, deep ocean is very similar to space in um, in its mystery and um, you know how in uninhabitable it is for us. You know we need protection. We need vehicles and craft to go down there, right? But in this film, they found a way to um, for deep space travel, and um, they came in contact with only an alien life form or life forms. Um, quite rapidly once they got down to a certain level and um, most of the crew were prepared um, there's this really cool scene where um, this alien life force whatever it is wherever they are they can manipulate the water and so within their um, craft they I think there's a little uh, leakage of water and so this the, the, the entity manipulates the water um, like a worm and it's kind of like um, spying on them to see and see what they're about and you know how they're reacting and um, it gets face in face face to face with one of the um, two of the main lead, ca lead characters um, and uh, it looks at them and they look at it and they're amazed and you know they're a little afraid but they're um, taking the experience very well and then one of the actors well they, they the, the face changed to the shape of the actors it mirrors them and then the character i think his name's buddy he the main cat one of the main heroes he smiles at the face and the, f the face smiles back at him and he laughs and the face laughs it's almost like it's mirroring mirroring his emotion maybe it's reacting to his emotion this is the thing and so it's a very healthy interaction, but there's another character um, who's ex-military, <coughs> I believe, um, maybe ex-marine, or something like that. And he starts to have a mental break quite rapidly because he can't handle the reality shift. The reality down there is obviously nothing like up here. It's a different world down there with these other life forms. They don't seem to be uh, carbon-based or organic like us in the movie and he starts to have delusions and in his mind i think he thinks it's like the russians or something like that and this is secret russian technology um that um that you know um america doesn't know about and he's got to try and find out and he thinks that maybe some of the american crew are like russian spies working for the russians and they know about this technology so he um is trying to take you know take everybody out and um hijack the mission and he's having a he suffer he suffers in the end from complete psychosis he gets violent and dangerous and they have to take him out this does make me reflect on um you know uh the type of people that you would need for um future space travel you know uh, it's not maybe just about hardened military men they have to be out of the box and have an expanded mind to be able to deal with any of the strange shit out there, right? So, um, there, that that came to mind. Um, very interesting there. Um, what else have we got? Done that one. Modern space travel, but um, yeah. So, looking at the. The old way of uh, space travel. Um, I think that they um, like if these things were real, the people that piloted these ancient fly machines were really, you know, the closest thing you could compare them with now would be like uh, a Jack Parson and Alistair Crowley. Now, especially a Jack Parson. Um, yeah, because Jack Parson he knew about the hardware. Which is really the only the tip of the iceberg, right? You know, being the rockets, being aerodynamic, having the right shape. That was obviously a gift that he um, was born with. Um, so he knew about that. 
But um, he knew it's much, much more. This is um, about consciousness expanding. It's about prepping, being able to um, deal with space travel. And so, um, in a way, he would make the perfect astronaut, perhaps. But um, and Crowley, even you know, to to be able to come up to to confront anything out there, you know. Um, because I'm thinking these these um, people of the past they had probably such a perhaps powerful influence over matter you know they were such great magicians that they really could um, significantly bend the laws of physics and um, you know change reality and uh, have access to um, you know other dimensions as you know this is a thing I don't think it's just about uh, space travels in physically you know going through our atmosphere it's, it's multi-dimensional travel I think and so they would ha understand about frequency frequency vibration um, and all of that you know um, you know uh, quantum physics and um, they may have access past present and future you know through through their will what, it, what did it say with the vimena vimenu mythology it's the will of the um of the actual driver i believe and i th i think that back then the um the hardware they used was really a symbol more than anything it was practically all done with the um psyche of the of the um of the driver right this this is really how it probably um originate originated from you know these 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 people probably could have teleported their self um anyway and you know traveled astrally or you know literally physically disappeared into other worlds and dimensions to come back you know maybe maybe it started in um that they used they 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 weren't as a uh, confident and they needed a symbol of their intent so they built these um these vehicles as a symbol of their intent and then sorry if you can hear music outside but so a symbol of their intent and then uh, later they realized they didn't need the actual physical craft they could just do it by themselves so like I don't know if you've played around with something, I think it's called a psi wheel, where you just get a, you can get like a tip of a biro or a, something like that, or a cocktail stick, you get a piece of paper and you fold it in several places so it's like a, like that, you just put it on the top and it, you can basically uh, move it left or right um, with your own um, wheel. Um, but first off, naturally, you start kind of with your hands near it. Maybe it's like, that's what I, I did anyhow, like, maybe, you know, like the electromagnetic force in your hands, your aura, you're kind of connecting it with that, uh, moving it with your chi kind of thing. So you're using these as symbols of your intent. But then, as time goes by, what I found is I didn't even need, you know, my hands. I would, it would be all in here, and you'd have a feeling, and like a sensation, like a... An empathy with the object uh, like what I mean by empathy is like you've got this two pence coin right it has a certain weight and a feel then if you can imagine how that would feel if it was like you put it on the edge of a table and it and it's gonna tip you visual how the weight would feel as it was tipping and that's how you can get a connection with an object right that's what I kind of learnt with the with the psi world experiment and maybe that's really all it was the the craft was just a a symbol of their intent so the building of the craft is a is like well it's like the ritual of i'm going to travel here i'm going to go into another dimension or i'm going to you know um travel high up in the sky or something like that um just a thought i found quite interesting and inspiring um Let's see if I've got anything else to say. I think there's a few more notes here. Yeah, so going back to actual um, 
like space travel. I'm thinking like um, just a thought. You know, we have dark matter where um, most of what's out there we can't decode and see. Right? We can only see a small range of this of this spectrum of what is out there. That we we call that light. You know, because we can physically see it. Something along those lines. So maybe when you um, you enter space, because you're not dealing with the laws of gravity and um, atmosphere, you can start to, you know, if your brain will start to decode more of the other life forms out there. And um, maybe space is actually a physical representation of the other side of the spirit world where you have a lot of these um, disincarnated beings and spirits whatever you want to call them existing and moving around you know um, and something else maybe think as well with the moon um, all this talk about uh, no carbon you know like uh, just thinking like I think it was Max Egan made the point like they don't want carbon, like reduce your carbon footprint, zero carbon, zero carbon footprint. Well, we're carbon based life forms, aren't we? We're organic carbon based life forms. So, what do they want? Something like the moon? Because that's probably zero carbon, assuming there's no life on there, right? So, with that in mind, maybe let's say uh, there are other dimensions, there are other beings existing. We're beings. We are, um, let's say, souls in, incarnated into these bodies, into these vehicles, right? This is our home, you know, for now. And um, But this uh, earth is, is a plane, it's, it's a type of existence with laws, um, natural laws that we have to obey and, and harmonise with, um, you know, like in... Uh, in, is it the Celtic uh, mythology they call it Midgar or something like that, Middle Earth? But there are other realms. Well, what if um, what if the moon is home to the disincarnated uh, beings? Um, yes, everything's energy. Yes, it's all uh, waveform, uh, like um, you know, like a radio station at David Icke makes the example of like um, if you can only tune in like to five um, stations you're limited but there's hundreds of thousands out there right so yeah we're in these different dimensions spirits and demons and what it fairy and jinn whatever you want to call them um, aliens they're on different frequencies and dimensions if there's if they're if, if they're, if, within this multi-dimensional nature of life and life forms but what if the moon is there physical expression of their home as is the earth the physical expression of her home and so the moon has its own laws its own natural law and as as does the earth and like maybe um, the things like demons, spirits, jinn, all of that um, that's their home and maybe when the, you know the American astronauts landed on there they soon realized that that it is occupied just like Earth is, but in a different way. And they came face to face with that, and they may, you know, were maybe told, listen, this is our home. Um, so, you know, just as we uh, find it difficult to visit yours, but we can, you found, finally managed to get your tin can up here and uh, have a visit of hers, but your uh, ancestors didn't do that in the past. They were much more effective. They could zip, zip, zip like us. They actually became as effective, and then... You know, so uh, just thinking on the spot, all of the um, people say, uh, and I'm fully open to it, the idea of uh, ancient technologies, you know, invented by man, you know, not aliens like the pyramids. And um, there could be loads of um, preserved hardware, you know, that the elite have kept hidden. We could have done it all again, you know, all before, rose up, destroyed ourselves, built ourselves back up. But this could have been... Um, achieved by um, you know the pioneers of the Vimenu um, you know dipping into other dimensions seeing past present and future etc you know so yeah maybe we have to like really explore space travel 
on a whole different level, more of a, like a maybe a right brain uh, level, a um, kind of subconscious creative level instead of just the physical. Uh, maybe the physical only plays a small part or at least 50-50, you know, like we need to kind of bridge the two hemispheres of the brain to finally, you know, activate our powers. Um, yeah, hope that was mind expanding. Um, hope you enjoyed it and um, I will see you uh, in the next video for more um, thought-provoking ideas. Cheers, bye.